the census has been extended. So yes. that's another thing that we must do because they don't want us to fill that out either. That's right. And another, in addition to the fact that they don't want to have to share political power by way of representatives, and they don't want to have to share any more of that more than $700 billion a year that's spent every year based on census data, they also know that redistricting is coming. So when you hear Stacey Abrams talk about the fact that we're not just doing the 2020 election, we're also doing the 2010 election all over again, what she's talking about is that every year following the census, Every 10 years following the census comes a period of redistricting. And redistricting is a, is a geo-mapping project that basically redraws the boundary lines of your community and says where the edges of your communities are and with whom you are grouped for the purposes of representation and voting. In 2008, everyone was very excited about Barack Obama getting into office. But in 2010, when people largely stayed home and when voter suppression was rampant and so people who were trying to get out and vote couldn't, what happened in 2010 was the census, which means whoever was voted into office in 2010, when many of us did not vote, in 2011, the very next year, I know these are numbers, but stay with me, we created pyramids, we can do this, in 2011, every Republican who was brought into office by many of the people who stayed home, they were able to redraw the boundary line, which is why in some states, you might have people who might vote 60, 65 percent Democratic, but they only are able to get 40, 45 percent of the of the benefit of that vote because the Republicans drew the lines in such a way that it would minimize the impact of Democrats um, and Democratic policies. So 2010 is the same thing we're doing right now. 2020 is the census. Next year, I'm already building my team. We're working on mapping projects so that we have unity maps for black people. We want maps in our city to be representative of the new, the numbers that we actually have here and not have us all either packed into one jurisdiction so we only have authority in that jurisdiction or so far cracked, and those are the terms that we use, packing or cracking, so far cracked apart that we don't have the ability in any jurisdiction to make any inroads into our own agenda. We have got to make sure we are at those polls because whoever is in office and come 2021, they are going to be redrawing your boundary lines. And that is all based on census data. So you can talk about, I don't want that out of the census. I don't want the man to that, 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 that. We have spent plenty of time talking about what the census is. It is just a population count, a survey that tells the government how many people are in your community. They take that number. They feed it into formulas for affordable housing, for WIC, for SNAP, for uh, food stamp benefits, health care, schools, and senior census services, transportation, infrastructure, okay, Detroit and state parts of Michigan that are about to be underwater. They just feed those numbers into those formulas. And at the end of that mathematical formula comes how much money your community going to receive for said service. So it is very simple. This is not some deep state exercise. We've been doing it since 1790 when back then we only counted as three-fifths of a person. But what we need to know is that when we were only counted as three-fifths of a person in 1790, we were still more represented in the census than we are right now, where we sometimes wow. in some communities only show up at 20, 30, 40 percent. So we had more of a census count back in 1790 as three fifths than we do right now, because a lot of us ain't going to go to my 2020 census. I go and fill that damn thing out. 866-801-8255 is the number. As, mm, you just messed me up with that. <laughs> you just I promise you. We were more represent. I'm reading um, Mercer Barandaran's book, The Color of Money. Yes. And I- I'm, I'm reading it really slowly. I'm digesting it. I- I'm savoring it. And she talks about the distrust of the banks that w- because of the Freedmen's Bureau. Distrust right. that to this day, we still suffer a lot of that wealth gap, a lot of the health disparity. Distrust based on what was physically done to us. Yes, it's warranted. But we cannot allow the distrust in the system. And a lot of people aren't voting because they distrust politicians and they distrust this government. It's warranted. They've earned that distrust. But we have to be politically and and emotionally savvy enough to put ourselves in a position to win in spite of everything that's been done. And that's a tough thing to ask people, to put aside your distrust, to put aside your hurt feelings that are warranted. You know, it's like being abused and it's like, forgive your abuser. Nobody's saying that. We're saying get the, get the sledgehammer and the power over your abuser. And the only way you're going to get that is through filling out that census and making sure. And listen, the vote, the census, you may not see the benefit in the next year or two. 
This is a long game, but we do have the ability to play a long game. That pyramid at Giza took 20 years to build. Still standing, still standing. So 866-801-8255, thank you for that. I had to digest 1795. We had more representation than we do today. Ouch. And, Let's go to the phone. And we need to be clear about what that representation did. A lot of times we talk about the three-fifths clause as, oh, they were only counting us as three-fifths a human being. They didn't see our humanity. It ain't had nothing to do with humanity. It had to do with the distribution of money and power. Why? Because this population, the four founding fathers of this country, decided to distribute political power and money through total population count. The South realized they had a whole lot more black people than they did white people because in some states we outnumbered them eight to one. I'm looking at you, South Carolina. And so they were able to negotiate that they needed to count at least some of their enslaved population because they wanted to be able to pass legislation and they could not do that if they did not have the votes in Congress. So all of the compromises that came after that, the Missouri Compromise that determined whether black people, whether your state was going to be slave or free, the South was able to get what they wanted because they had that three-fifths count. When it came to whether the Fugitive Slave Act, they were able to pass that legislation because they were able to use our bodies in the census count and get represented representation, which meant they had more votes in Congress. I, listen, I don't know how to how a car works. Like I don't know how to put it together. If you ask me to, you gave me all the parts of a car right now. I would have no idea about how to put it together. I do know how to get in the car, turn the key, and drive it be it a stick or a power or a manual or, or power steering. I know how to do that, but I don't know how to how those systems work. When it comes to living in this country, and I'm always a fan of saying, if we don't like it, we can leave. That is an option. We don't like to explore it. We can do it. But while we're going to be here, we don't have the luxury of just sitting and driving. We got to understand how those systems work. And those are knowable things that are within our realm of possibilities, because otherwise we're going to get run over by the very car we were asked to put together. Let's go to the phones. 866-801-8255. Let's head over to Hugh. Hugh in New York. Welcome. Laurie Daniel Favors is here. Hi, Karen. Thank you for taking my call. What I'm calling about is like there's a, the 100 million people that didn't vote. I had an experience with a coworker, and she really opened my eyes. She's about 38-ish, has some kids. I got, I'm a Karen rebel. I'm a party member. I'm a Republican. And they mailed me uh, a vote at home, you know, to avoid the COVID-19, stay home, stay safe. And I asked her, instead of going to vote in the polls and being exposed to this pandemic, you know, vote for home. Just take a picture of this thing and go online and register so they can know you, your absentee ballot. This girl was so lazy, she wouldn't even take a picture on her phone because she was eating some grapes and she didn't want to wash her hands again. And I was like, well, let me have your email address. And she wouldn't even give me her email address. But what I'm trying to get to is that this girl says, she said, I don't even know who to vote for. So most of these young people, they rather laugh. We're laughing ourselves to death. You know what I mean? They're not even engaged. So, like, this show, I love your show, you're preaching to the choir. It's the ones that's not yeah. even getting it or even have a clue. And probably her mother, she probably got it from her mother, and she's teaching this to her kids. You know, it's systemic, it's generational, and it's like, how do you reach people? And it's, you know, I don't understand. Yeah, you know what I, mean? I, I, I wanted to feel that way. I was feeling that way recently, actually. Because I, I feel like I am preaching to the choir here. That folk, these folk that listen to Sirius, if you're going to pay for Sirius XM, you, you're special. You're not a normal person, you know. It's, it's, you're in a different space, a different headspace. You care about things differently. And that's not to say that we don't have uh, some people that think differently because that the, makes the world go round. But by and large, we're talking to people that, you know, one and one is equal in two and things make sense. But I'm not going to quit talking. Because here's all we need is one person in that family to get it. And usually that person becomes a crusader. You know, all, all you need is for somebody to start drinking clean water by accident. Maybe they picked up the wrong glass. They tuned in to 126. They were listening to Fly or something and they were, or the Prince Channel. And then it was like, what? It, it flipped over to 126. And they're like, what is this? <laughs> you know, and then something happened. I don't know. I feel his frustration, what he was talking about, Laurie. But we can't quit. We can't stop talking. We can't quit, and we have to recognize that even if this this show right now, when it comes to these issues, is preaching to the choir, everybody in this choir is going home to people who ain't in the choir. This the caller who just called, like you, you may be a part of the choir, and so I think what's important is everyone in the choir is supposed to be able to sing, but we all come together for choir practice so that we can learn the song. 
so we can learn how to harmonize the song, so that we can learn that when the soloist goes off on a run, that we can drop the music and only keep the drum beat and go on a cappella, and that we can keep it going, sopranos, tenors, altos, so and we can all make that music continue to flow. And I, I'm reminded of, of my sister in the struggle, uh, Eldoy Williams, who hosts the, the Sunday Civic Show. She and I did a recording a couple weeks ago, and I could tell that she could tell that I was pissed off at the voters, so they were getting on my nerves, and she reminded me, we cannot get angry at people who do not understand and for whom the value in understanding has never been fully represented. So while you may be a part of the choir, this is really an opportunity for us to have conversations that will empower us to teach other people who aren't listening why it is we need to know what it is. And we have to do that with a level of patience and humility. And I, I say that because even no matter what it is, whether we're talking about voting or, or community organizing, if you are used to generations of di being disempowered, you don't know what it is to have power. You don't know what it is to fight for it, to seek it out, to, to learn the systems that distribute it and to apply them to your own life. And so we have to ap approach our community with a level of love and a level of humility. Because Harriet Tubman, again, she didn't have that gun to fight off the white folks who were chasing them. She had that gun because she knew that the internalized enslaved mentality of the people she was trying to free might sabotage the entire mission. That gun was for her to aim at the brothers and the sisters who was like, I can't do this no more, Harriet. I got to go back. Nah, boo, because if I let you go back, they're going to catch you, they're going to torture you, and then you're going to give up the whole operation. So I got this gun for our, all, all of our safety. And so I think we just have to approach it a little bit differently, and we cannot... We don't blame people who don't have legs for being for needing a walker or for needing a wheelchair or for needing crutches. We provide what they need so that they can have equitable access to the benefit of the information that we have. Thank you for that. And I think you spoke straight to me. I'm going to yell right now because I'm a hit dog right now. You <laughs> no, you know, it, it, and it's easy to forget, you know, t to to walk into your purpose, you know, at a, at a relatively young age, to, to, to be sentient, to be empowered, to be, the, you know, by birth, to, to have nothing happen to you but to be born into a household where these things were important. So for you, it was always important. There's a, a level of entitlement that comes with that. I sit with entitlement every day. I'm an entitled person who's very, I can't remember not being empowered. You know, my daddy told mm. me as a little girl, you're a hunter. There's nothing you can't do. There's nothing you can't. So I grew I grew up expecting the world to lay down for me. So when you said that right now, I just I and thank you. I'm convicted um, because it is frustrating when you, you look around and I don't see people without legs. So you're right. You know what I'm saying? If, if I need to change how I think about it, because I'm like, why don't you know this? Why, why don't yeah. you want this? Why aren't you yeah. angry about, why aren't you out here, do, you know, X, Y, or Z? You know, even talking about Malcolm X, who was raised in a similar household, but who, whose daddy was taken away at a young age, whose daddy was taken away at a young age, but still had those foundational pieces. And so when he went that way on the streets and ended up in jail, he, he turned to what? To books. Right. Studied the studied the, the dictionary, learned more words, empowered himself through words, through scholarship. But he had to have that foundation. And, you know, I think the and assumption. And he had Bimby. He yes. had Bimby. He had so a teacher. When, he's, in, when yes. he's incarcerated, he had a teacher who yes. taught him at the level that he could receive. And who put that medicine in the applesauce that was going to be flavorable and palatable to him. Yes. And, you know, I'm reminded your question before the break about. How is it that one person could have shifted so much? I think that really speaks, and you were talking about Malcolm X, I think that really speaks to why we need to have institutionalized knowledge as opposed to personal charismatic leadership. Because when we institutionalize knowledge, when we do like a Fannie Hamer or a Septima Clark and we're using, the, we're recognizing that our community can't read, we're illiterate. So she's going to teach you how to read, she's going to use the Constitution. And while she's using the Constitution to teach you how to read, she's going to teach you all the rights that come through along with the Constitution. So she's not only giving you knowledge Knowledge that you mm. want, ergo, I want to read, but she's also giving you access to political empowerment so that by the time you learn how to read, you also can debate these issues with the language that they created. And you can fight for what it is that you want using the frameworks that they created and bringing with that your approach to the world as an African descendant person. So we, we have to institutionalize the distribution of this knowledge and not allow it to stay within the realm of charismatic, uh, charismatic leadership.
Mm. I, I think I inherently understand that, which is why it's super important that we have so many voices on, on these airwaves that come at it differently. Cause I know I'm not going to reach everybody. I know, I know that for a fact. <laughs> I know there's some people who just cannot take what I bring every day, but thank <laughs> God, you know, there are other places you can go and I'm not offended by that. I, I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I know you could tune in on Wednesday and get Larie. Tuesday, you're going to get Drew. Thursday, you're going you're gonna to get Cena or somebody else. Lamont's coming through. We're going to have different voices come through regularly. You don't have to digest everything that, that, that comes out of my mouth because we lay the, the plate so that there's something for everybody, you know, right. and, and you may be the person who's listening right now who could be that voice, as Larissa said, in your home, in your community to get the message out. We got to know what our limitations are. I, you know, you know That's what I'm right. saying? So 866-801-8255, thank you for that. And, and you've said it before, you can't expect a person without legs to just get up and walk. You got to give them the, the tools, the walker, the, the crutches or what have you until they can get there or maybe get some prosthetics but right. thank, we got to be mindful that not everybody can walk who's listening. 866-801-8255. That's why Larry's here. I'll be lost sometimes. I'm like, is she coming in today? <laughs> I need to talk to her about these things. 